No, I'm just about to join the Zoom meeting with the leader. So that'll be about an hour and a bit. Can I ring you back? Hello. Hi, Melanie. Melanie, just to let you know that we are live streaming at the moment just because of the technical difficulties that we've had in, in recent weeks. Okay. Right, okay. All right. Councillor Byford. Can I just let you know that we are live streaming at the moment because we've been having some technical difficulties over the last couple of weeks. We just wanted to make sure that everything was running okay ahead of the meeting start. So it does mean that members of the public can see us at the moment. Hi, Councillor McBride. How are you? All right, thank you. But just to let you know that we are live streaming at the moment because we've been having some technical difficulties over the last couple mm. of meetings. We've, we've started it early just to make sure everything's streaming okay. Right, yeah. Councillor Jeffrey, hello, hi. Hello. Just to let you know that we are live streaming at the moment because we've been having some technical difficulties uh, streaming to our YouTube account. So it's just to let you know that members of the public can can see us and, and listen to us at the moment. Fine, thank you very much. Okay. I'm sure we'll be fine with that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, is everybody um, here? Looks like it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, have we any apologies for absence? Oh, yes. Um, Roger Marsh, is it, isn't it? Sent uh, yeah. apologies. Yeah. Uh, Roger Marsh uh, was in a previous meeting and it might have uh, overrun. Uh, Councillor Groves also sends uh, apologies. Okay, then. Thank you. Um, can I draw your attention to the declaration of interest? and exempt information, I don't think we have any. At the minutes of the last meeting, can we agree those? Agreed. Fine, thank Agreed. You. 
Thank you very much. Sure. And then we go on to item five, the capital programme update. Um, Melanie, who's taking us through this? Yeah, I'll take you through this one, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, just just the um, the usual update in terms of a, a look across all of the capital programmes. So we've set out for you um, where we were in terms of the budget forecast at the end of last year, the in-year forecast at June, and then actual um, quarter one figures. Um, we're currently working on the quarter two return, so we expect to be able to report those next time. Um, it's also worth noting that we talked last time about the Getting Building Fund programme, and we've got five out of the 15 projects that have now entered the appraisal process, and the others are expected to, to submit by December. So we're moving on those, and they will start to come through for Investment Committee to consider um, in the coming months. We've set out this time a bit more detail around the Leeds Public Transport Investment Programme. So this one... Uh, sets out the, the projects that are currently uh, being delivered, those that are now complete, and those that are due to start. So at the moment, we have a, a slight over-programming position on this programme, and we'll have a, a clearer idea by January as to um, which schemes are definitely going ahead and, and the allocation against those schemes. Um, you'll recall that this programme is due to finish uh, next March, March 21. Um, the DFT have said that if we are in contract on schemes by that date, they will allow us to honour those contracts and spend in the following financial year. So we do expect some spend next year, um, but obviously we are managing the programme now towards the end with the intention of actually spending the allocation rather than spending a higher amount uh, with the over-programming. So you've got a position here in terms of where we are and we'll present something again when we have a clearer position in the new year um, to give members an overview. Um, the other area that um, we've just picked out this time is around broadband. So just to let you know um, that we're continuing to progress with our, well, we've said challenging ambition to get 99% coverage. Um, this should be addressed through contract three and we're making progress against that now. So they're the two programmes that we've, we've picked out this time. Are there any questions on that one? Denise, you're on mute. Yeah. All right. Any comments or questions? No. no. Can we agree the recommendation then that we note the progress made? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Item six is the capital spend and project approvals. Um, yes, thanks, Chair. So we, yeah. we've got a number of items on the agenda today um, in this report. The first couple of items are to, to relating to um, transforming cities funding. And the first one is the active and sustainable travelling at Wakefield. And Vicky Dumbrell is going to take us through this one. OK, thank you. Good afternoon, um, Vicky Dumbrell. I'm Programme Manager um, at the Combined Authority on the TCF Programme. So this is the strategic outline case for the active and sustainable travel project in Wakefield City Centre. And the package is coming forward for funding through the Transforming Cities Fund. So Wakefield is served by three main public transport interchanges, um, Kirkgate, Westgate and the bus station. Um, and many of the bus services use Union Street to access the bus station at present. Um, and the levels of congestion in the city centre can be quite high and that often can impact on, um, on journey times and reliability of the bus services. So this scheme will look to deliver bus priority and also traffic management measures um, to improve that reliability and to encourage the greater use of, of buses as a means of transport. Um, in addition, in order to encourage and facilitate more cycling, um, the scheme will provide high quality cycling routes within the city centre um, to provide more connectivity to those um, bus and rail stations um, and also providing a cycle hub um, for parking um, for cyclists. So the scheme is also delivering some high quality public rail measures um, in the northern quarter of the city 
Um, so that will include measures to improve walking and cycling provision um, and also to manage the level of traffic um, within those areas to, to enable greater accessibility to the businesses and services in that area. Um, in terms of the impact of the scheme, um, so it's around improving the access to the bus and the rail stations by sustainable modes of travel and encouraging um, the modal shift to more sustainable uh, means of travel, improving the reliability and the journey times of the bus services and managing the levels of traffic in the city centre, um, as well as improving the attractiveness and accessibility of um, the public spaces, um, local businesses, education facilities and employment sites in the city centre. Um, the scheme's not without its risks, um, the key of which being around um, delivering the project by the funding deadline for TCF, uh, which is March 2023, um, making sure that there's um, a full and robust consultation and engagement with the um, local um, stakeholders and uh, general public, making sure that that's well managed. Um, and ensuring then once we do get into delivery um, that multiple packages are managed smoothly within um, the city centre. The total cost of the scheme is currently forecast at 13.6 million to be funded from TCF. Um, 406,000 of development costs have been approved to date and the request today is for a further 119,000 pounds from the Transforming Cities Fund um, to progress the OBC. So that would take the total approval so far to um, £525,000. I think that covers it, if there's any questions. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Vicky. Any questions? Any comments? We are happy with that. Okay, thank you very much, thank Vicky. You. <coughs> the York package. Yeah, Fiona Lim's going to take Fiona us through doing that, that. Yeah, hi, <laughs> Yeah, so Vicky's one of the new recruits on the TCF um, programme, so I'm finally handing over some of these schemes for others to introduce, so thanks to Vicky on that one. Uh, so this is the, I think this is actually the the final uh, the final package that will be coming forward for at Strategic Outline Case from the Transforming Cities Fund. Uh, we do have one more project, which is, is looking at um, carbon mitigation across the entire programme that's still being, being developed, so that'll come forward in due course but this in terms of the infrastructure packages this is the last one um so this is the york station and city center access package um and uh, it obviously will be funded through the transforming cities fund um the package um, is in effect um, delivering elements of the, of the wider um, York Station Gateway scheme that's being um, developed to date um, through the Transport Fund and it will provide um, kind of enhancements to that package um, that um, comprises of a number of ele elements. So um, the, um, the Station Gateway um, project itself is looking to provide infrastructure to try and relocate private vehicles from immediately outside the rail station and um, free up the, that um, quite congested um, station frontage um, and provide safety benefits for people accessing the station on foot and by bike and, and also improving the, the interchange um, with bus, bus users. So um, that, that kind of bus rail interchange opportunity for people arriving by that mode. Um, in addition, this package will also look to improve um, park and ride. Um, the the Askham Bar Park and Ride site is obviously on the outskirts of the town and um, this scheme will look to improve some junctions along that route to um, improve just bus journey times um, and provide that, um, you know, improve that, that journey into the city. And alongside that, some um, small scale cycle route enhancements on Queen Street and Lehman Road to again provide those connections into the rail station from other parts of the city centre. Um, and finally, the, the package will look to introduce a um, enhanced cycle parking at York Rail Station. It's already got significant amounts of cycle parking. Um, but um, there, is, there is significant demand there and um, this will provide an enhanced um, facility. Um, there. So I think it's 800 spaces they're looking to introduce. Um, so as I mentioned, this is actually kind of 
this TCF funded package complements the wider um, York Station Gateway and York Central Access um, programme and um, effectively this will be form one more piece of that jigsaw as it comes forward and the next stage of the assurance framework um, the TCF elements will be merged into that wider project and programme so it will be coming forward actually at full business case um, plus costs at the next stage. Um, so uh, that's that's the that's the route, um, and therefore we're hoping it's one of going to be one of the more earlier deliverables um, when it comes forward for delivery um, over the course of the next year. Um, when we're looking at the clean growth and climate change implications, as with all of the transforming cities pro projects, we're looking to reduce carbon emissions by making public transport and, ac and active travel uh, more attractive um, and encourage people out of their cars to make those journeys um, and improving that interchange between rail and bus and um, active modes and, and rail in this case. Um, the key risks around this particular scheme are, as, it, as I mentioned, it is forming one piece of a, a larger jigsaw um, and the, the scheme in its entirety has, a, has obviously land negotiations ongoing, um, working with network rail around the delivery mechanisms for a number of these elements. And as with most things in York, there's a risk around archaeological remains being found as they start to ex excavate sites. Um, so all of that um, is being uh, managed by York City Council as the, the lead partner in this project. Um, um, we're also working um, with York to understand the timing of the different elements and making sure that um, the TCF funding can be delivered within those timescales. It's probably worth noting that in terms of the costs, um, with this being a, um, a scheme outside of West Yorkshire, those um, transforming cities um, contribution will be capped at that lower level, so it wouldn't be um, subject to any additional funding over and above the DFT funding that's been awarded. And in this case, um, that's 14.47 million. Um, and to date, we have um, approved um, £420,000 for um, development of the of these scheme elements um, and at this, at this stage no further funding has been requested for that next stage of development because it is forming part of that wider project. Um, so when we um, come to the timescales, um, we're looking to start on site in October 2021. Um, they are due to receive full planning consent in the next month or so. And they're just, as I mentioned, working through with the, the different partners to understand the, the delivery um, phasing and um, who who will be delivering which aspects, because it, it is a complicated picture in this one. Um, in terms of completion, as, as mentioned, because they are um, constrained to the TCF funding, that will be need to ensure that that is delivered by March 2023. Um, the appraisal summary um, details that um, the project is aligned to our strategic objectives and the, and the objectives of the Transforming Cities programme. Um, and um, it, the appraisal says that for the, for the stage of it, the project is at the, the comfortable that um, the necessary um, elements are in place to take it forward. So therefore the recommendations are that this um, package proceeds from um, decision point two and actually work commences on activity five so that's full business case with finalised costs um, that an indicative approval to the total um, TCF package value of 14.57 million um, is granted and that um, the future approvals are made in accordance with the pathway so that's straight to, to full, full business case was cost so decision point five. Thank you. Thanks Fiona. Andrew. Thank you. Uh, I thought that was a very good introduction. Um, as anyone who's uh, come out of York Station will realise that that is a very congested and <clears throat> rather confusing uh, entrance. So this will really make it a much better uh, place uh, to get in and out of and as, as a, an entry to the city. And bearing in mind that the projections, notwithstanding uh, where we are uh, with the pandemic, the projections were to uh, have uh, current, there's currently 10 million uh, passengers a, a year use the station. The projections are that this would go up to 30. Uh, and therefore, there's a background of uh, significant increase in, in usage. Um, the Victorians were particularly effective at stripping out any archaeology in the vicinity when they were laying the railway lines. 
so this project also removes uh, Queen Street Bridge, uh, which uh, we don't need trains to be driven into the old station because that's now the council headquarters and it'd be rather inconvenient uh, to have <laughs> trains driven into our offices. So uh, it opens up the opportunity for a much better uh, bus and taxi um, pick up place. And uh, I've just cycled in and out to town as part of my exercise uh, today. Um, and it, it really would make a lot uh, of improvement for cycling. Uh, there are some pinch points which are a bit difficult for um, so for cyclists. And this has been through a number of consultations recently because it is coming to um, final planning. Um, but I think that it, it has improved a lot and it does very much align with the objective of uh, encouraging sustainable and active transport. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Roger. Just a clarification, Fionn. Did you say the uh, that the scheme is fourteen point four seven million as per the papers? Or did I hear you say fourteen point five seven? I just wanted to be precise, obviously, because it's a recommendation that we're making up to the combined authority. That's, that's a very good point. Um, fourteen, sorry, fourteen point five four seven is the figure that I have in front of me on the papers. OK, well, the papers I've got say 14.47. So perhaps we can just clarify can... offline chair just to make sure that we will. We are content. I know it's only a small amount of money, but it's all public money. So I'm, I'm a bit no. I'm a bit draconian when it comes to that. Yes, we need to get it right, Roger. I'll check those and make sure. That thank the right thank you, chair. And I, and I wasn't trying to trip you up for you on at all. I just wanted to be <laughs> precise. It's the accountant in me. I can't help myself. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, any more comments? And are we happy to approve? Okay, thanks very much. Okay, uh, the next one is the um, Halifax Town Centre, Calderdale. It is, it's A629 Phase 2, and this is Caroline Coy that's going to take us through. Hi, Caroline. Hi, good afternoon, Chair, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm here today to present the A629 Phase 2. The A629 Phase 2 Halifax Town Centre Scheme is being delivered through the West Yorkshire Plus Transport Fund A629 Halifax to Huddersfield Corridor Programme, which was approved by the Combined Authority back in 2015. The A629 Phase 2 Halifax Town Centre Scheme will deliver interventions including enhanced walking and cycling facilities and connections into the town centre. The scheme will reroute the existing bus services to ensure journey reliability and introduce new bus stops at the Southgate Wards End Link and Alfred Street East Horton Street. This will improve the bus rail interchange and user experience, therefore making public transport more attractive. Overall, the scheme will also deliver high quality public realm and a better transport net network, which will improve accessibility to education, the employment and also development of sites. The scheme will deliver a series of public transport and active travel, walking and cycling interventions to improve, improve connectivity and accessibility to and within the town centre. The scheme is being delivered through the West Yorkshire Plus Transport Fund. It supports the inclusive growth principle of better quality of life by enhancing the walking and cycling and public transport access, obviously to education, the retail and also the bus and rail interchange, as well improving the streetscape and attractiveness of all public spaces within the town centre itself. As part of the overall programme, the average BCI is 2.69, which represents high value for money for the overall programme. The scheme supports clean growth by enhancing the active travel and public transport provision within Halifax town centre, and it also has encouraged the modal shift from car with better walking, cycling and bus connectivity to employment and education. Additionally, the scheme supports a low emission multimodal travel system across Calderdale and the city region with better bus rail interchange opportunities to and from Halifax. The scheme will also pedestrianise Market Street and North Gate, reprioritising highway to pedestrians and will deliver public rail enhancements across the town centre, most notably at the Eastern Corridor, which will also include many street planting. The scheme also seeks to install a minimum of two electric vehicle charging points for public users, building on the office for low emission vehicles, uh, a taxi charge point scheme being delivered by the combined authority in partnership with the five partner councils. The scheme costs, so the total scheme cost estimate at full business case activity four is 47.84 million, be it wholly funded from the 1.261 million 
A629 programme. A further approval of 2.598 million development costs is now sought for the, from the 47.84 million total scheme cost estimate. The total cost to the combined authority for the overall scheme is 47.84 million. So today I'm looking for the investment committee to approve that this scheme, the A629 phase two, proceeds through decision point four and work commences on activity five for business case with finalised costs. An indicative approval to the total scheme value of 47.84 million is given from the West Yorkshire Transport Fund with full approval to spend once the scheme has progressed through decision point five for business case with finalised costs. The development costs of 2.598 million are approved to progress the scheme to decision point five for business case with finalised costs. And obviously the, the combined authority would enter into an existing funding agreement with Calderdale Council for that expenditure. And any future approvals are made in accordance with the assurance pathway and approval route that's outlined in this report. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Caroline. Um, Jane, do you want to come in? I do, thank you, Chair. And this is, this is one component, one project, which is part of the, a wider programme really for, for Halifax. And, and I suppose it should be seen as the whole programme. We've done the very successful first bits. We've got a stage four, et cetera. I should just mention there isn't any stage two. It's one, one three and four. I don't know why, but uh, lost in the mists of time as to why that decision. But it is really about making the historic core of Halifax really somewhere where people want to walk. Um, officers talk about having boulevards in Halifax, tree-lined boulevards. I wouldn't go quite that far, but it would make an enormous difference um, to air quality, uh, pedestrian, um, the, the general feel of the town. And it does actually upgrade 14 signal junctions very practically and helping to reduce um, the problems that we've got with air quality around the town, which is a bit choked, choked by those, those roads. Um, and it's very much at the end of a travel corridor, you know, all roads, all roads lead to Halifax really. So it's a really important part, really important component of the overall programme for us. So thank you, Joan. Um, obviously it's important to, to the to Calderdale and um, Joan made a good point there. Um, I think you're quite made us all smile, all roads lead to Halifax. Um, can we agree this? Okay, thank you. Thank you. The, the next scheme is uh, another Wakefield scheme. Who's it is, and Polly Hutton's going to take us through this one. Hi, Polly. Hi there. Hi, I'm Polly Hutton, the uh, project manager working on housing and regeneration. This scheme is the Kirkgate scheme in, in Wakefield South East Gateway. The purpose of the scheme is for the acquisition and site clearance of to facilitate um, assembled sites for future housing development. It's the Chantry House site in particular. The project um, will tackle market resistance to developing brownfield land in a marginal value area, acting as a catalyst to regeneration and development of the Southeast Gateway area. The key impacts of the Kirkgate scheme will be that it presents a viable housing site to the market through the land assembly and the clearance, and also enabling the delivery of 60 affordable homes on the site. Uh, in addition, there'll be improvements to the built environment and landscape enhancements as part of the scheme. The costs for the scheme are, the total scheme cost is 3.435 million, the combined authority contribution that's been sought is for 1.6 million from the local growth fund. And the council itself, Wakefield Council, are contributing 1.835 million of match funding towards the total scheme costs. So the recommendation that we're seeking today is that the um, investment committee approves that the scheme can proceed through decision point five and work can continue on activity six, the delivery element of the scheme that the combined authorities contribution of 1.6 from the local growth fund can be granted and that the combined authority enters into a funding agreement with the council for the expenditure of up to 1.6 million from the local growth fund. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Anybody want to comment? Darren, I thought you might. Um, as we all know, all, leads road to, all roads lead to Wakefield. 
Um, <laughs> and when they arrive in Wakefield, they actually arrive at this particular junction. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Um, eventually. Um, just sort of put this into context, it's pro- it is probably the, the busiest um, junction network, whatever you want to call it, that comes into the city centre, because eventually all roads do lead to this part of town. Um, and the the impact that the uh, work that's been carried out so far with the support of partners is absolutely dramatic and amazing, the pulling down of an old office block and the opening up of the spaces in that part of town. So the, the additional funding will allow us just to continue that work, to bring it all together, and then to achieve our ultimate aim, which is to stick some social housing in that particular part of town also contributes to our reduction in size of over retail uh, and bringing people back into the town centre who hopefully will live there, shop there, work there and enjoy there. Yeah, very good, Darren. Couldn't have said it better myself. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks very much. Are we all happy with that? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Thanks, Polly. Um, The next one is the... um, the Active Travel, the Lake City Region Scheme. Yeah, Caroline Farnham Crossland is, is going to take us through this one. Okay. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, hi. Um, I'll just give you a quick background on this, although I'm sure you're already aware of it, but it's it's worth recapping. So the government announced a 250 million emergency active travel fund, the first stage of a 2 billion investment across England in walking and cycling over the next five years. A further announcement confirmed that 225 million of this funding would be allocated to local authorities. A total allocation of up to 12.566 million was confirmed for West Yorkshire and that was split into two tranches. Tranche one, we have delivered. Um, So tranche two is, um, we've put forward an application of 10.053 million. That was submitted on the 7th of August in line with the indicative allocations published by DFT. Unfortunately, the outcome of this application for funding was expected to be announced early September, but we've yet to hear from DFT. We are hoping that something is going to come in um, relatively soon in the next few weeks. Um, But just to highlight to you all, authorities must fully commit the funds this financial year, i.e. by the end of March 2021. So we are up against it in terms of timescales. It does mean that these schemes have to be delivered at pace. Meetings are taking place next week with DFT and partner councils, and I'm also attending those meetings where we will be highlighting these pressured timescales. And hopefully we will, we may get some um, leniency on those. Um, just to make you aware as well, and again, I'm sure you're all, all already aware of this, but a letter from the Right Honourable Grant Shapps MP was received on the 16th of October 2020 in relation to the delivery of Tranche 1 schemes. Um, The letter did highlight that there was some disappointment in some of the schemes that have been delivered. However, we don't believe that this um, has anything to do with the West Yorkshire Combined Authorities schemes. And we are pretty certain that ours were very good schemes. And therefore, we don't believe that that letter applies to us. Um, As a result of that, we believe that we should secure 100% of the funding that has been proposed. In terms of the benefits for the Emergency Active Travel Fund, um, the fund will obviously relocate road space to support safe safe walking and cycling and to help make sure the road, bus and rail networks are ready to respond to future increases in demand. It will improve provision for cycling and walking, enabling more people to walk and cycle for local journeys and to employment and other key destinations. It will enable a mode shift from car through provision to allow safer and more convenient journeys by bike and on foot for local journeys, travel to school and for work. And it also fits in nicely with the climate emergency and green agenda. Um, The decision sought today is approval to proceed through decision point five, full business case with finalised costs and work to commence on activity six. Approval of the co- total value of combined authority fu- funding of 10.053 million, as I mentioned. Um, the combined authority enters into a funding agreement with partner councils for expenditure as set out um, in the paper itself. Um, I can go through those allocations if you want me to um, talk you through those. Um, approval sought for the investment committee to delegate authority to the managing director to amend the approval and allocation of tranche to emergency active travel fund if the DFT allocation differs from the 10.053 million. 
or if further changes to the individual allocations is required. In terms of this, we are thinking more in terms of we, there's a potential because we did deliver the projects in, in tranche one well that we may end up getting more funding, but obviously that's only speculation at this stage. Um, a decision by the investment committee using the delegated authority from um, the combined authority. And just to add on, whilst I am asking for approval for this, um, we did make the decision in part that we wouldn't progress um, the funding itself until we get the DFT approval, so nothing would be done at risk. So this is just for us to try and get ahead of the game um, in terms of just having um, approval ready to go as soon as we do get that DFT confirmation through so that we don't delay any further because, as I said, the timescales are tight. Yeah, I think that's very sensible, Caroline. Thank you very much for that. Any comments? Are we all happy to agree the scheme? Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Ooh, Wakefield seems to be on the roll. We've got another Wakefield one now. We um, have, and it's, it's Polly presenting this one as well. Yeah. Polly, Polly. Hi again. Yeah, this is Wakefield, Rutland Mills, which is very much linked to the Kirkgate scheme. Again, it sits in the southeast gateway area of the city. It's a project to restore the historic buildings, historic mill buildings and create a high quality public realm at the waterfront. It will deliver creative jobs hubs through studio office and learning space, along with an associated hotel food and beverage offer. The scope includes for demolition and redevelopment of the mill buildings along with flood defence works and some public realm enhancements. The contract was actually awarded back to the developer back in December and they began on site in March. Sorry, they completed the demolition in March. The redevelopment works um, began on the site in September this year. The impacts of the Rutland Mill scheme will see 6,909 square metres of commercial floor space and this is due to be delivered by December 22 along with 219 jobs created by March 2025. The total scheme cost is 20.911 million. Wakefield Council are contributing 7.333 million of that towards that. And combined with the local growth funding, which we're seeking of 4.9 million, this is a total grant of 12.23 million based on a fixed developer contribution of 8.677 million. We're asking today that the investment committee approve that the Rutland Mill scheme proceeds through decision point five and work can continue on activity six delivery. The combined, that there's an approval to the um, combined authorities contribution of the 4.9 million from the local growth fund is granted and that the combined authority enters into the funding agreement with Wakefield Council for expenditure of up to 4.9 million from the local growth fund. Okay, thank Paul, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone want to comment? No? Roger. Yeah, I just wanted to just add my support to this. I think it's a very exciting project for that part of, of the city and being adjacent to uh, the Hepworth, you can see all of the benefits of that and it's what it's been a scheme long in gestation and I just hope we hope we they can get on and crack on as quickly as possible so I just wanted to add my endorsement to what that's great right, thank you Roger yes thank you Roger it, say it has been going on for a long time I started dealing with that in regeneration about 15 years ago it just shows sometimes how long these things take but looks like we're making some progress so can we all agree that? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the next one is the Bradford uh, scheme, the high point. Uh, Polly's going to take us through this one as well, Chair. Right, Polly. Yeah, hello. The, the high point scheme is a Bradford city centre scheme. It forms part of the city centre heritage properties programme and involves the redevelopment of the building in the city centre. It's a former commercial property that's been vacant for around 23 years. The funding is now required towards some structural enabling works, which are currently constraining the viable redevelopment of the building. The impact of the High Point scheme will be the delivery of 87 new apartment homes, 
And on the ground floor, there's going to be 422 square metres of commercial floor space, both to be achieved by January 2022. They're hoping to start on site by December this year. The they will also deliver the redevelopment of the building will act as a catalyst for the investment that's planned in the wider city village area, which is a key regeneration area for Bradford. The total scheme costs are 9.432 million and the combined authority contribution towards the scheme is 2.9 million from the local growth fund. The developer will be contributing 6.523 million towards the development of the scheme. And we're asking that investment committee today could approve that the high point scheme in Bradford proceeds through decision point five and work commences on activity six delivery that the combined authorities contribution of 2.9 million from the local growth fund is granted and that the combined authority enters into the funding agreement with Bradford Metropolitan District Council for expenditure of up to 2.9 million from the local growth fund. Thank you. Thank you, Polly. Anyone want to come in? Alex, do you want to say anything? Uh, yes, I do. I can just hear my daughter running about in the background. So if I get interrupted and disappear, <laughs> then I apologise in advance for homeschooling this week. Um, so yeah, really pleased to see this one come forward, actually, Chair. And uh, you'll remember from when we've talked about conditioning house, which we're funding. Um, and I said at the time, it had stood empty 25 years as a, a listed building, an old mill building. And this one um, isn't an old mill building, but it has stood empty 25 years. And it's a different aspect of Bradford's sort of uh, architectural heritage in the city centre. It's a lot more modernist, um, probably splits opinion a bit more. Um, but we know the Civic Society held a debate on it. And, um, you know, there was a lot of people who were actually interested in the architectural style. And it tells a story of a part of Bradford's time. So to be able to be a part of restoring that uh, is really pleasing. And this whole area around the Bradford top of town, um, you know, we're, we're labelling it City Village at the moment and kind of restoring it creating a new uh, market to open up some development sites and we'll be liaising with people around master planning the area. But this shows it's starting to coalesce now, the identity and feel of, of that area. And it's uh, it's another step in the right direction for the city centre in Bradford. So uh, pleased to see it coming forward and uh, look forward to watching its restoration alongside Conditioning House as well. Okay, thank you. Sounds like a good scheme. Everybody happy with it? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. The next scheme is a Bradford scheme as well. The next one. Is this the park? Sorry, is this the park and rail park one? Park and ride, yeah. Yeah, so there are there are three different elements to this one. And just before I, I hand over to Simon, I just wanted to flag that there's there's an error on one of the, the sets of figures. So if I take the... Um, the Morthorpe scheme, um, the total project value should be 895-869-92. And the approval to enter into the Section 56 agreement with the River Rail North should be for up to 722059. So I'm going to hand over to Simon, who's, who's going to take us through the project, but just to flag up those, those figures. Uh, hi. Thanks, Melanie. Thanks, everybody. Um, it's first my first time using Zoom, so I don't know if anybody can see me. Have I come on can, screen? Or, we can see oh you and we can hear you, Simon. <laughs> I, I, I'd well. like to apologise for that in advance. Um, <laughs> right, right, the uh, the paper that I'm um, presenting today is for the Rail uh, Park and Ride Phase 1 programme. Um, it's a programme of 14 stations across West Yorkshire, where we're increasing um, rail car parking. Um, and uh, uh, the paper today is looking at three um, locations, Steeton and Silston, Moorthorpe and Normanton. Uh, it's funded from the West Yorkshire Transport Fund allocation, and we've got a programme budget of 31.5 million. We've uh, successfully delivered uh, four of those car parks so far, uh, two others are on site and we're working through the remainder. Um, we've got two delivery mechanisms. Uh, one is with Northern, Northern Trains, 
who are delivering some of the car parks for us, and the others are through the partner councils via a funding agreement. Uh, this, uh, today, the paper sort of concentrates on the northern delivery mechanism, uh, which is uh, the contract means is a section 56 uh, grant agreement. Uh, and it has transpired uh, that um, uh, we shouldn't uh, be paying VAT on um, uh, uh, when working through a grant agreement because it might be construed as a commercial contract. So um, we've, um, we've been in touch with HMRC and uh, Northern and uh, our finance and legal teams and legal specialists, and we're proposing uh, this uh, revised method of uh, delivering through the Section 56, which is to increase... Um, the project uh, budget by 20% for these three, uh, these three locations. So it rolls that into the uh, grant agreement that we give to Northern. And that satisfies um, HMRC um, and our own procurement and Northern as well. So uh, there is no change proposed to the scope of these, these three projects. They will still be delivered through a section um, 56 agreement, it's just that we will increase the value um, to account for that so that um, we're compliant with, um, with HMRC. So what we're looking for today is approval of the increase of 20% uh, increase to account for VAT on these three locations. The funding is going to be contained. We're forecasting we can contain this within the uh, budget we have already of 31.5 million. Um, and the headline figures are, if we get this approval, we can start on site with these three projects. They're ready to go into delivery. And uh, we're going to start um, early next year um, to, to de deliver these three. So does that make sense? Um, is that sort of given a flavour of what we're after and the decision we're seeking. Yes, it certainly <laughs> does, Simon, yeah. Any comments, anyone? Melanie? Yeah, Chair, if I, if I could just come in. Um, we, we do often get asked um, if it's the right thing to do to still be funding um, public transport interventions, um, given the, the current situation. And I think that there's a couple of, of reasons for wanting to proceed with these now. One is that it does cause a lot of disruption when we try to increase the size of the parking provision um, for the rail users. And Northern are saying to us, this is the best time to undertake this work yes. because there will be less disruption to people's commuting plans. Mm -hmm. so, so that's one thing. And I think the second point is, this is a, a medium to long-term investment in public transport and, and encouraging that increased usage. So even though the numbers are down now, we do expect them to, to, to come back. We don't know over what period, but we are expecting that there will be demand for public transport. And therefore it's important we feel that we're putting these projects forward for you um, and, and recommending approval because um, we think there will be a bounce back in, the terms, in terms of patronage. Yeah, I'm sure there will. It might take some time, but I'm sure there will. Um, anyone else? Okay, can we agree this? Fine. Thank you, Simon. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Um, Calderdale scheme next. Two schemes for Calderdale. Who's doing these? Yeah, so, Chair, th there's a number of, of schemes that were highlighted um, in the summary section where these, this is, this is for noting that these have, were delegated to the MD and um, we've progressed with these. Um, so there's the two um, SIP schemes for um, the Calderdale um, programme. There's also um, City Connect Phase 3 uh, for the Centre of Leeds as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Fine, thank you. Yeah, are we all okay with that? Okay, thanks very much. Okay. Um, that brings us to the end of, um, of that item. Um, the uh, next item is the carbon impact analysis. Chair, is it possible to do it agenda item eight? Because we have um, an officer that needs to leave.
Yes, of course, yes. So if we can swap them around, that would be great. And if we can come on to the assurance framework. Is it Ian that's doing the assurance? Ian, Ian Pegg's going to take us through. Hi, Ian. Do you want to deal with um, your item now? Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone is well. Um, yeah, we uh, the paper that is uh, in the pack is uh, a presentation on uh, where we are in progressing uh, the update to the assurance framework so that uh, it becomes uh, the document that takes through the Mayor Combined Authority and meets the uh, requirements of government in terms of how we uh, assure and progress our projects. Um, I just want to give a little bit of context to this in that um, in, in updating the um, assurance framework, it's given an opportunity for us to um, take on uh, views from colleagues across the Leeds City region. So we started this by undertaking a consultation back in June and July, um, and we uh, managed to touch over 250 people um, across the whole of Leeds City region from uh, council members through to uh, chief highways officers down to the programme project managers who would be using it. Um, Largely, over 80% of respondents were, uh, were favourable about the assurance framework and how it currently operates. Um, and they uh, recognised that it was a useful document as a check and challenge function to make sure that we were achieving our strategic objectives. Um, but there were a number of comments around, um, since we have moved on and the assurance framework has been in place since 2015, that it's a recognition that one size does not fit all and that there are now lots of complexity in the schemes that we do and there has to be some flexibility around time scale as we have schemes that come from government that we have to turn around quickly to meet short, short time scales for funding. We've taken all this um, into account in redrafting the framework and we've done a, a, a lot of work around removing duplication um, and uh, making it read as a better story whilst it still has to meet the national guidance set by government. Um, in terms of where we are, um, we're, this, the document that is in front of you within the papers is still very much a draft document and it's still going through daily revision as um, policy officers and colleagues around us uh, as we develop thinking and we understand better how we're going to take things forward, we're continuing to, to uh, tighten the wording that's in there. Um, our target for uh, delivering this, it has to be with government um, on the 1st of December. Um, so we are in the final three weeks of our revisions. Uh, what I'd like from the uh, from uh, the investment committee is any comments that you may have on the document itself or any thoughts going forward. Okay. Anyone? No, I think everybody's um, happy with that, Ian. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ian. Thank you. Okay, the carbon impact analysis, the last item. Uh, Patrick Bose is going to take us through this one, Chair. Okay, fine. Hi, Patrick. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Hi there. Hope everybody can see me. Uh, thank you. Yes. Um, yes, uh, this paper presents um, an update on the work for the Carbon Impact uh, Clean Growth uh, Assessment Project. Background to this is it's uh, a consultancy project which we've awarded to Mott McDonald's uh, to develop our approach to the assessment uh, and quantification of uh, carbon impacts and to understand how we might improve our business case approach to the uh, quantification of those carbon impacts and uh, in terms of the uh, business case development process. So in terms of where we are with the project, just to sort of overview, the obviously the background to this work is the uh, uh, the, the climate emergency, which has been uh, 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 set out quite clearly by the combined authority in terms of our uh, aspirations for 2038. Uh, the committee received an update in um, uh, at the meeting on the 1st of September, 
outlining the, the work to procure uh, the, the consultancy support to develop the project. Uh, since then, uh, the project has moved uh, on at great pace. Uh, we've established a steering group made up of all the five West Yorkshire local authorities and also uh, York uh, as a member of the transport fund. That steering group is overseeing the delivery of the project. The project is structured into uh, a series of phases. Uh, phase one, uh, which we're currently in, which is an overview of national and uh, best practice in the uh, uh, quantification of, of carbon, uh, particularly in business cases uh, around the world. Uh, uh, phase two is the development of the carbon impact tool itself. Phase one will set out the principles that will drive the development of the uh, of the carbon toolkit that will be developed in phase two. Phase three sees the uh, application of the uh, toolkit to all of the transport fund projects. Uh, phase four is where we look in more detail at a, a smaller subset of projects uh, in, in, uh, in delivery and uh, look at mitigation measures and make recommendations as to how we might address issues of mitigation around some of those projects. And then five, phase five is uh, a strand of a uh, commitment to tra uh, training and literacy. So this is particularly us working both within the combined authority and across our uh, local authority partners to ensure that we embed the new uh, uh, approach and we work with project managers to ensure they've got the right skill sets to uh, reflect these kind of considerations in the design of projects in the future. Uh, the paper overview is where we are with the, the, the outcome of the, uh, of the phase one work. As I mentioned there, it's a review of best practice uh, also a review of our current internal decision making processes within the assurance framework uh, in terms of how we take carbon into account and then obviously recommendations um, for those check for our business case development process as to how we will then develop the toolkit. Uh, some of the general findings I think that we're worth pointing out that uh, we do now have a phase draft phase one report and obviously we'll seek to uh, uh, amend that phase one report uh, based on feedback from the uh, from the committee and the steering group. Uh, we have been out to consultation with the steering group uh, for comments on the phase one report. Uh, some general findings, I think, though, are quite quite relevant, I think, to, to, to uh, today's discussion. The uh, recommendation from the consultants uh, that the uh, uh, principle of proportionality should be followed when assessing the impact of carbon projects, that uh, we should have a consistent set of assumptions and rules uh, should be adopted when we're uh, appraising carbon in our business cases, and the requirement to assess uh, carbon should apply to all project types. And so there's some general principles. At these early stages in terms of development of the work, the consultants have, have also made some uh, specific recommendations, which I think are tangential to the development of the uh, assurance framework and will align with the work that colleagues in, in delivery are undertaking on, uh, on the review of the assurance framework. So at stage one, um, um, a strategic assessment, uh, there's a recommendation that should be a check on the alignment of proposals with the carbon emissions reduction pathways. Uh, at strategic outline business case, which is activity two in our business case title, proposals should be subject to a qualitative screening process to assess the wider sustainability and environmental impacts. Uh, at outline business case uh, uh, activity three, and indeed for business case activity four, there should be a quantitative assessment of the, the impacts of carbon uh, for, for all projects. Uh, the carbon, uh, and that should take into account the carbon included in the construction of any of those projects, that's so-called embodied carbon, um, make sure that we, uh, that we have a clear way of presenting the impacts to the proposals so that they're meaningful to decision makers. So particularly keen, obviously, to get feedback from the investment committee on, 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 on this aspect of, of how the results are, are presented. Um, the carbon impact to the, um, of the, um, should be presented separately uh, from the current economic appraisal uh, and sit alongside it. Uh, we ought to be mindful of the uh, background assumptions that are used uh, when assessing uh, uh, carbon, particularly around sort of assumptions on overall traffic levels uh, and how to take account of the impact of, uh, of the proposal itself on wider behaviour. So the, the issue of so-called induced uh, uh, um, uh, impacts as a result of specific transport or, 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 what, or other project interventions. Uh, as I mentioned, their work in phase two has already begun. Uh, we are anticipating uh, that we will be reporting back to the uh, investment committee and the combined authority um, with initial recommendations as to how that framework will work, what will be its key elements in, uh, in, de in, in December. Um, obviously, there are a number of considerations that we and the consultants and, and indeed our um, wider local authority partner network need to take into account in terms of the development and the application of the toolkit. 
particularly around the, the issues of fleet composition, general background traffic levels, uh, the impact of schemes on wider traffic behaviours and the issue of induced traffic uh, and, and induced environmental and, and carbon effects. Um, I think it's worth pointing out it's not anticipated that, that, that uh, there will be significant changes to any of, of the schemes currently in full business case uh, at stages of the uh, our business uh, business cycle. These schemes were conceived and developed before the climate emergency was declared. The focus of uh, the carbon work is very much uh, on those projects at outline business case stage and, in, and, and those in the, the development process. As I mentioned there, we're working very closely with all councils in the, on the steering group and the steering group will be overseeing the review of the, uh, the recommendations in relation to the phase two and the development of the framework and um, the, t the paper itself sets out the uh, the actual phases for, for phase uh, three, four and five with the uh, 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 pr wider dissemination and project learning and guidance activity taking place into up to August 2021. Um, so obviously in terms of, of, of next steps, we're obviously quite keen to get feedback and comments from the uh, from the committee to reflect those in the draft phase one report and to make sure that we we understand how we will develop the presentation of the uh, of the, uh, the, the the new outputs from the uh, the carbon tool in a way that meets the needs of, of, of decision makers so hopefully that gives you an overview of, of where we are with the project and and, and the key discussion points and, and indeed happy to to take any uh, any uh, any questions thank you patrick that was very comprehensive um i think you have a number of questions jane Thank you. That was very comprehensive. There's some very difficult things within that, like calculating embedded carbon and uh, and so on, um, and the, the various parts of our supply chain for, for various things. But the question I wanted to ask was really about um, the public in terms of the West Yorkshire Combined Authority, in particular, in terms of making some of this transparent to the public, that we are thinking about the climate emergency going forward and retrofitting where we can, of course, going forward, does the public actually realise that we are trying to make our climate emergency declaration real by, by running the rule over these schemes and also helping applicants understand what kind of things they need to, need to do? Um, how do we make this transparent uh, to the general public, really, um, without some of the technical detail that Patrick's so kindly given us? Shall I, Melanie, would you like to respond or would you like me to? No, you, you go ahead, Patrick. Okay, y yes, I mean, I think, yeah, it is a very technical project. We, we do we do appreciate that. And we think the messaging and the comms on this is actually quite important. So uh, uh, one of the key things we were careful to do with the uh, commissioning of this, this consultancy project was to ensure that Mott McDonald's had a, uh, a strand of their project that was very much about communications and partner engagement. Uh, and that we have a clear marketing uh, and communications plan for the, for, for, for the activity. So that's one of the things that the consultants are working on at the moment is how we get clear, uh, consistent uh, messages out there that will aid decision makers and, and, and indeed the wider public. So we are working very closely with our communications team on then how we communicate the outputs from the work, particularly as we move through stage phase two and, and into phase three. Do you want to follow up, Jane, or are you happy with that? Fine. Roger. Yeah, I really just want to build on Jane's point uh, about not only um, public awareness, but just to check in, Patrick, and I probably should know the answer to this. Um, you reference the partner councils being involved in the steering group. What, what's the membership of the steering group beyond that currently? Um, beyond the steering group, it's obviously officers from the uh, uh, combined authority and 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 officers from the uh, the six uh, transport fund uh, local authorities. That, that's the primary and uh, um, composition. Yeah, of the group. yeah I, I, I guess you were going to say that. I wonder whether there is a need, uh, particularly as we have a green economy panel and chair who's deeply credentialed in this area to include him or some others from the business community, because I think to Jane's point, there's a, there's, it's actually getting everybody believing that we are serious about this and understanding what parts we all will play to deliver something on or before 2038. It's a, yeah. it's a very good point. Yeah, Roger, very good point. Yes, and I think we can we can we can follow up on that and and, and we can make we can make that offer to the chair of the Green Economy Panel. Yeah, that sounds good. Melanie, do you want to come in or? 
Yeah, I, I was just going to say, I think it'd be helpful to report the progress on this through the Green Economy Panel anyway. So I think it's worth having an item on, on their agenda um, and then we can update them as we're developing this. Um, we've got a number of projects that are keenly awaiting the uh, the toolkit um, because I know they want to apply it in terms of their project. And I think a lot of this is about the demonstration that we are considering these factors. And obviously, our reports are public, our meetings are public, and we will be reporting in the appraisal where we've done the, the carbon analysis uh, alongside the, the economic analysis, as Patrick outlined. So it'd be great to see some of those projects coming through early as, as the pilot ones, really, Patrick, um, when you want to test out the toolkit. Uh, I, could, I can give you a list of schemes that are interested now. <laughs> Yes, indeed. Yes, I think I've got a good idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Roger. Yeah, I just wanted to follow. On. I, I do understand the difficulties of retrofitting in terms of the things we've already uh, approved and let let alone approved, but spent money on and invested in. And uh, but to what extent um, do we need to look back just to be clear that maybe. Uh, wittingly but unwittingly made some things better but carbon slightly worse so that particularly I'm thinking for my uh, uh, public authority local authority colleagues elected otherwise that we're able to not necessarily defend uh, decisions made without this sort of analysis but at least explain that whilst we have created a slightly difficult more, more problematic area by doing this that the economic and social at the time uh, outweighed. I, I just wondered whether that's something we should perhaps reflect on, Chair, not necessarily in the context of this meeting, but how for you all and all of us, we're able to, as I say, explain rather than have to find ourselves defending based on uh, anecdote, legends and myths. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's on that, yeah. Peter? Yeah, I think there's as far as climate change is concerned, we've got to have two levels of response. One is a very detailed kind of thing that Patrick's just been talking about. And then a response on a regular basis, which reacts to so, um, lobby groups who will um, tax all of us at any point in time about any when there's an opportunity to, um, to raise an issue. I mean, currently we're dealing with one at the moment in Berkeley's, and I suspect there might be an attempt to um, get that get a reaction from all of you um, on, on the same issue. But so it, a lot of the reactions at the moment, I'm considering really obviously a lobby group put out the standard letter, got them all to send it to members and get a reaction. And that's caused me a, a lot of work and councillors who are not involved get in, in a flummox over it. Um, but then there's a, a much more sophisticated response, which Patrick, Patrick refers to. And the production of such a document would be really helpful so that we have a standard statement about the way in which we are progressing all schemes and how we're applying, well, an agreed criteria to deal with a difficult situation, as Roger referred to it, retrofitting um, um, our carbon agenda around programmes already approved. Yeah, I think that would be good. And I think if we could have a standard across, I'll bring you in in one second, Andrew, a standard across across West Yorkshire um, so that it, we can't be sort of picked off in other areas. I think we need some sort of standard. Andrew. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just to, to build on the, the previous comments, I think it'd be helpful to have um, some background um, documents that can be referred to uh, for those members of the public, very legitimately involved. Um, but there are some individuals who uh, ask some very detailed uh, questions and, and therefore uh, having that background um, would be helpful. Um, just one specific point I'm obliged to raise from, raise from the uh, people at home is that York's um, climate emergency target was 2030. So just a, an acknowledgement of that. I know it's, it's, it's yeah. touched on in the report, um, mm -hmm. but I think it's, it's better to focus on um, the actual delivery 
and as, as Denise said, it's about making it real. Uh, and I think, as, uh, as as Roger said, it it that then links with the economic and social aspects of there is a holistic approach. It's not it is not purely about reducing carbon. It's about making a better uh, economy. And therefore, the more that we can concentrate on that narrative than uh, and and leave the the the, the detailed analysis uh, to another sector. Uh, then I think that enables us to focus on the real things. Yeah, I agree. Okay. If I may come in, Denise. Yeah, just so I may come in, just to, you know, not so much re-emphasise, but restate my point, which is, you know, Andrew said, is to, to try and limit the myths and legends. You know, I, I don't want to get into a specific, but there was one, you know, major um, uh, connectivity, international connectivity matter that, I took some personal time to understand um, wh wh where where the challenges are, uh, and it's actually not necessarily the physical infrastructure, but what, what, what leaves what leaves and comes back is part of a, a global problem. And, and I guess it's it, and, and and I'm trying to be helpful here because, uh, of course, everybody wants this done yesterday, but we've also got to keep driving our economy, and even more so as a result of what. It has been, you know, inflicted on all of us locally across the north and inter nationally and internationally. So that's why I'm quite keen to be supportive as, as well as rather than end up in in no disrespect to anybody with sterile arguments that mm. just just actually slow down what we need to accelerate in the coming months and years. Yeah. Yeah, Melanie, do you want to finish off? Or yeah, thank you, Chair. I mean, I, I was just going to say the, the point about the, you know, the, the focus on the outline business case and the strategic outline case it, it is absolutely right, because if we're factoring that in now at the early design stages and when we're looking at options, we've got a much better chance to, to address this right from the very beginning. It's much, much harder to, as, as we say, retrofit some of this by the time schemes are getting to full business case and they've already been through a number of rounds of consultation. But one of the things that we can look at is whether we need to look at offsetting at a program level as well. So we do have an opportunity to look at that depending on what comes out of the review so far and what comes out when we start to apply the toolkits. If we need to do that, we can look at that at a program level. Yeah. That's it. That raises a really interesting point, Melanie. Again, sorry, Chair, that um, whilst we're developing these uh, measures, these toolkits, et cetera, um, we're still approving projects and putting conditions down for the investment of public money. To what extent do, should we consider, again, offline, Chair, um, putting in some words that say, should in the event that when we have this tool and we've, we've put it over a project as part way through, we might need to consider some carbon uh, sequestration aspects on a particular project in terms of landscaping, otherwise we building that opportunity. Maybe I'm making it too complicated, but it strikes me again, that would be a source of difficulty if we hadn't sort of built in the opportunity to, to, to implement before schemes are fully completed. But perhaps I say something to take offline, perhaps Melanie and Chair. Okay, yeah. Well, I'm sure we'll come back to this again. I mean, we are gonna have um, a, a, a session uh, with members and officers. Um, so perhaps that could be could be raised and Patrick can attend that and talk to us again. Absolutely. Okay. Anyone else, anything else they want to raise? Okay. Well, take care everybody. Um, look after yourselves and uh, we'll see you when we come out of this. <laughs> Are you on the other okay. side as they say? Yeah, take care, everyone. Yeah, thank you.